All right, I think that this is the uh, mall where I'm supposed to meet Molly here in San Francisco, and it's kind of a complex mall. It's hard to see anything. Not a lot of people sitting around, some eating, some drinking coffee. Where did they get the coffee? I don't see any counters. I don't see any baristas. Wait a minute, somebody is handing out coffee over there, but, it, but it's not a someone. It's just a white robotic arm. What the heck is this place? I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. In this episode, an area of technology that has the potential to radically upend the workforce even more than it has. Robots and artificial intelligence are being trained to do a range of more diverse and complicated jobs, perhaps even yours. From field workers to artists to doctors, imagine a labor force with more more machines, more computers, and fewer people. We'll find out what, if any, human jobs can't be automated and which ones are about to go the way of lamplighters and switchboard operators. I'm off to meet Seth, and in this episode, you will meet your robot barista. Hey, Molly. Hi, Seth. Sorry that I was late. I was at the other Cafe X. Uh, oh, the two Cafe X. No Cafe Y or Cafe Z, any of that. So where's the robot? Well, he's right behind that glass there. <laughs> and it's only an arm. He's it's somewhat disarming. There's no more to the robot but the arm. We're standing in front of like a, a kiosk. Yes. It's in a corner of this mall, and it's, it's a relatively small kiosk. It has a couple of order stations, you know, where you touch screens and so forth, and it has this robot behind glass, and there are a bunch of coffee makers behind them and a huge store of paper cups. This disembodied robot arm may point to a larger trend, because while technology has always displaced some workers, and in this case it's displaced a barista, the futurist Martin Ford says this time it's different. I don't know for a fact that people will work for a living in the sense that we do today, 100 years from now. He is the author of The Rise of the Robots, Technology and the Threat of a Jobless Future. Technology has always displaced work, and over time that has definitely made us better off. And I don't think that will change, but I do think this time around we're looking at perhaps a much greater impact than what we've seen in the past. And the reason is that the machines are on some level beginning to think, you know, they're taking on cognitive capability. They're competing with our brains as well as our, our muscles. Uh, they're making decisions, they're solving problems and so forth. They're doing a lot of things that previously only human beings can do. And uh, ultimately, I think that is gonna lead to, to a big disruptive impact. Give me some other examples. I mean, you know, I had some guys out that were painting my house, the outside of my house, uh, not so long ago. And, you know, that's not a brainless task. They have to, you know, tape up windows or whatever. Uh, is, is that something that's also amenable to the uh, robot uh, invasion? Many of those kinds of jobs are probably relatively safe for the time being. And the reason is that they require a lot of dexterity and mobility and so forth. Think of something like an electrician, a plumber. Uh, those jobs are really hard to automate. But on the other hand, and this is kind of the paradox because people tend to associate automation with lower skilled jobs. But on the other hand, think of an office worker that's sitting in front of a computer and this person may very well have a college degree, even a graduate degree, and they're doing some very sophisticated quantitative analysis or they're writing reports and so forth. A lot of that might be susceptible to automation simply by software. And we already see systems, for example, that can write news stories, they can automate what journalists do, and you can read one of those stories online, and it won't be obvious to you that it was, it was written by an algorithm and not by a person. So the range of jobs that can be impacted is, is very broad, and the really important point I would make is that it can include a lot of good jobs. It's not just the low-wage, low-skill type work. Well, tell me how you do train a robot. I mean, you have this robot, some industrial robot, say, and you want to teach it how to paint cars coming off the assembly line. Uh, you know, do you have a guy who used to do that or <laughs> still does that? Do you just show it by example? How do you teach it? Uh, some of the smaller, newer robots, you can do it that way. With the big industrial robots you find in factories that are painting cars and things, those require, you know, technicians, engineers to, to program them. And that's a very elaborate process, and it, and it has to be done with, 
with extraordinary precision. I mean, that's the whole advantage of using these robots is that they're so precise. But the machines are getting a lot more flexible. Um, there are also examples of robots that can learn by themselves using the latest advances in machine learning. There, for example, have been uh, robots in research labs that have been able to look at videos and figure out by analyzing the video how to do things. Or there are robots that can simply use trial and error and use a kind of a evolutionary approach to get better and better at doing a task. So there are lots of developments happening in these areas. You talk about uh, genetic robots. Maybe you could explain what genetic... <laughs> a Sorry. genetic algorithm is an algorithm that's based on the way evolution works in biology. In other words, it will try different options, and then it will apply some kind of a fitness test to that to decide, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And if it's a bad thing, then it basically throws it out, just as a bad mutation would be thrown out of the gene pool. And if it's a good thing that helps it reach its goal better, then it adopts that. So it's, it's really just like biological evolution, except that rather than happening over millions of years, it can happen over really tiny fractions of a second. And so um, this is something that is potentially quite disruptive. Many people think that in the future, as we have perhaps genuinely intelligent machines, um, evolutionary or genetic algorithms may be the mechanism that injects creativity into that kind of artificial intelligence. So it's quite a powerful technique. Well, even that aside, uh, it sounds so far as if any job that you could teach an intern or an apprentice, you could teach a robot. That's right. And the thing that that is really different nowadays is that there is so much data in the world today. That's the thing that's really changed in the last decade or so. You know, everything people are doing in the office, in the factory, and so forth, a lot of that is being captured in data. Now, that data can then become a kind of a feedstock for future algorithms that might be able to churn through that data and figure out how to do things. So it's not necessarily just about teaching a robot. It's that the data may exist for a robot or an algorithm to learn how to do a lot of things already. Can you give me an example of that? Sure. I, I mean, you know, machine learning is, is now everywhere. I mean, it's become just enormously important. If you, you know, Google with their search algorithm, they use machine learning. Amazon, when it gives you other suggestions for products that you might want to buy, uses machine learning. Dating services match you up with someone that might work out. They use machine learning. So it's all over the place. And even very high-level jobs are beginning to be impacted by this. One of the most exciting areas of, of using these kinds of techniques is in medicine. For example, in radiology, there are already systems that in some cases are actually outperforming human doctors at recognizing cancer and so forth. In fact, one extraordinary story I heard is that there's now an iPhone app that doctors only can use, and it takes a photo of maybe a skin condition and then analyzes that and tells you if that's skin cancer or not. And there was actually an expert at Stanford, one of the top people, who actually looked at one of these cases and thought that it was benign, but then at the last moment decided, well, maybe I'll just try this app. And it actually turned out that the system caught a case of skin cancer that this top uh, dermatologist actually thought was benign. So, so there have actually been instances already where the machines have outperformed some of the top doctors in the world and, and potentially have actually saved lives. Speaking of workplaces with very few uh, humans, the cover of your book, I can't help but noticing this, the cover of your book shows sort of a Cubeville uh, scenario, but all the cubes are filled with robots and they're leaning over the cube walls talking to one another. There's one human on the cover and he's mopping the floors, but it seems to me that that's the first job that would have gone. Well, in some ways that might be true, but again, jobs that require lots of dexterity are, are harder to automate. So to give a specific example, I mentioned a radiologist as being one job that could potentially be automated in the not too distant future. This is a job that requires going to college, then to medical school, then probably at least five years of uh, residency training. But then consider the person that cleans your hotel room when you go on, on a trip. That job is much harder to automate because it involves lots of dexterity, mobility. Uh, you have to be able to recognize an unlimited number of objects in different configurations in a hotel room and figure out what to throw away and what to keep and so forth. So this is an example of how the high-skilled job that pays a lot of money is actually potentially much easier to automate than a low-skilled job that pays a much lower wage. And that's one of the paradoxes that people are, are a bit surprised by, and I think that the cover of the book kind of captures that idea. 
uh, if AI does take over some of these sophisticated jobs, will it also take over, you know, positions of authority, even governance, county clerk, policeman, even president? Well, you know, we are definitely relying on algorithms more and more. And this is one of the issues that's being debated now because one of the problems with machine learning and deep learning in particular is that it's not transparent in the sense that we don't really understand why it's making the decisions that it makes or the suggestions that it comes up with. So we are, in some cases, putting algorithms in positions of authority. And that has already led to some issues. For example, one example is that there was a machine learning algorithm that was used to suggest whether or not prisoners should be paroled. So this is obviously a very you know, important, life-changing decision for people. And it was found after much analysis that this algorithm was operating on data and it actually had a racial bias. So this is something that, of course, is very disturbing, but it wasn't easy to figure that out because the algorithm is not very transparent. So that is becoming a very important initiative, I think, in the AI community to how do we build these systems that can explain what they're doing so that if we do begin to rely on them more and more for important decisions, we know that they're operating in a fair and effective way. Can you give me an example of uh, what has most scared you about this subject? Well, the thing that concerns me the most is the potential impact on employment. I, I do think that potentially we could be looking at millions and millions of jobs disappearing. I mean, just to give one example, think of the impact of self-driving cars. I think that that may take a little longer than some people are suggesting, but certainly within 15, 20 years, I mean, this technology is going to arrive, and, and that means that taxi drivers, Uber drivers, truck drivers, those jobs are all going to be threatened. And that's just one specific example. Um, there are going to be robots in fast food in the McDonald's. Right now, Amazon warehouses are a big source of new jobs and employment. Those warehouses are definitely going to automate further and further. Amazon is already working on robots that can do what the people in those warehouses are now doing, which is to pick items off a shelf and then put it in a box and so forth. So there could potentially be an enormous disruption, including, of course, a disruption for higher paying, more skilled jobs as well. And I, you know, I'm not sure our society is ready for that. What are we going to do then? We have then two problems. One is that people don't have jobs. They don't have a way to survive economically. They also don't have money to spend, which means that now you don't have the kind of consumer demand that you really need to drive a market economy to allow capitalism to thrive. So this is potentially an enormous problem. And this is just you know one of the concerns with AI and robotics. But Martin, don't you get some pushback here? Because a lot of predictions have been made about future technology that are depressingly uh, dystopian. But, you know, you might want to consider the fact that we will just make adjustments along the way, and the future won't turn out to be quite as dark as uh, it sounds like it might be. That's certainly a possibility, and I don't dismiss that. I just am concerned enough that I do think we need to take this seriously. Specifically talking about the impact on employment, this is something that has come up again and again in the past. In fact, in, in my book, I talk about the Triple Revolution Report, which was a very prominent report written by very smart people given to the president of the United States. And it said, this is going to happen really soon. We're going to have millions of people out of work. It's going to be incredibly disruptive. And that report was given to Lyndon Johnson in 1964. And of course, that didn't happen. So there is kind of a bias out there, I think, particularly among economists, which says, look, this has come up before. People are worried about this. It hasn't happened. And so there is some kind of fundamental rule there that says, you know, this isn't going to happen. We're going to adjust. And I, I, I am skeptical of that. I think that there is a point at which this time can be different. And, and I think that, you know, we may well be getting pretty close to that point, given the advances that we're seeing in technology. We may not be whistling in the dark here about this. That's right. Martin Ford, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. It's great to be here. Martin Ford is a futurist who writes about the impact of robots and artificial intelligence on society. And he is the author of The Rise of the Robots, Technology and the Threat of a Jobless Future. What was interesting about that interview was that he was actually there for the interview. He was sitting next to me or across from me. And I thought, you know, maybe the next interview will be with a robotic head, a robotic interviewee. For now, Martin Ford has job security. But we can't say the same for the baristas in this town because we are about to order coffee from this robot barista. You know, he's got to do a good job, otherwise no tip. There is a human being over here. My name is Boris. I work for Cafe X. I'm an on-site technician, so I'm trained to fix any technical problems that we have with the machine. But are you worried that... Uh, 
that maybe your job could be roboticized? Um, not at all. I like to think of myself as a barista that doesn't actually make the coffee. I'm here to talk to the customer without being busy and cranky and annoyed at the fact that I have to rush through orders. We love talking to you, but we want to talk to the robot. Um, give us give us a bit more time. We're working on that. <laughs> you can talk to the robot, Molly. Just don't expect it to talk back. Does it concern you, though, that this machine is replacing humans? I wouldn't say so. I'd say that this machine is taking over a sort of task that's very mechanical in nature. But to be clear, we have a robot instead of a human serving the coffee, but we still have a human to watch the robot. Exactly. I'm not necessarily watching the robot. I'm more making sure that if something does go wrong, technically, I'm here to fix it and to make sure that we're fully stocked. My question is, is it demonstrably more efficient than having a barista? I mean, do you serve more cups of coffee per hour than a barista could? Our coffee is really, really, in terms of time, very, very efficient. And we can do about two cups of coffee a minute or so. That's our average. So that's depending on the complexity of the drink. It's all espresso based. So all of our drinks are espresso based, but we do offer a macchiato, a traditional macchiato, which is an espresso with a tiny dollop of milk on top. You could have the drink machinato. <laughs> definitely, definitely. All right, so we're ordering coffee here using a touch screen. Tap to order. All right. My goodness. They're just, I don't know, like a dozen different uh, kinds of coffee. What do I want? I want a, I want a latte. Well, do I do anything? Do you I have to enter your, your phone number. I do. The whole process is really straightforward. We just send you the code. It pops up on your phone when it's ready. Just put it into the panel, and then you have your coffee. The robot arm has woken up. Hey, it just put the cup there underneath the machine? Wow, hey, this is pretty neat. Okay, and now the machine is actually making the coffee, I guess. And the robot arm is waiting patiently for the latte. That's right, it's certainly got more patience. Well, actually, I don't know if it's patient. <laughs> Maybe it's waiting impatiently, but it doesn't look any different. It just doesn't move. All right, now the various ingredients being poured into the cup. Oh, now he's gonna grab it. Look at that, he, he made it on the first try. He's picked up the coffee, carefully puts it down on this piston platform, and it's waving at me. Now you need to enter your pickup code. What is my pickup code? It seems more complicated than interacting with a human. I, I guess so, but you know, I think the second time it would go much more quickly. And, and maybe after that, you know, it goes so fast that you, know, you might not even notice. Now, Martin Ford talked about the way that machines learn. How did our robot barista learn to do what it does? Yeah, I think it was trained, in fact, the way the robots that paint cars are trained, right? You know, you don't have to teach them much about paint or cars or anything like that. You just show them what to do. Right? And they just memorize the moves, and as long as everything's in the same place all the time, then they just, you know, imitate it, okay? So you couldn't surprise this robot with, say, bringing your coffee back and saying, I want a little bit more milk, or you didn't add enough cinnamon? I don't know if it would be surprised or not, but it couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> So yeah. this, this is not AI. No, I, I don't think you could call this AI. AI, in fact, can deal with novel situations, right, or very difficult situations like understanding maybe whether some chemical might help in curing cancer. That's not a matter of just showing him by rote what it has to do. It's not a repetitive task. Well, as Seth and I continue to take in the scene at the San Francisco Cafe, where a robotic arm is serving up cups of joe to its customers, we take a closer look at the threat to our jobs from AI, from Google's director of research. And also why the future of artificial intelligence may be developed in China. It's Meet Your Robot Barista on Big Picture Science. Did you know that 43% of college graduates are underemployed, working jobs that don't even require a college degree? Well, imagine if one of the most significant investments of your life, your college degree, only worked half the time. I mean, a refund is the least you'd expect. Flatiron School is doing something about this with courses in software engineering, data science, and UX, UI design. Flatiron School stands behind its students with a tuition money-back guarantee. Flatiron graduates enter into a career services program with career coaches and ongoing learning. Students who follow every step of the plan and don't get a qualifying tech job offer within six months of graduating are eligible for a full tuition refund. Complete details at flatironschool.com slash terms. With graduates working at hundreds of leading tech companies, the Flatiron School program is working. Full and part-time programs available online and at Flatiron School campuses around the world. 
Join the school that's reinventing education, starting with student outcomes. Learn more at flatironschool.com slash big picture science. So we're here in San Francisco sipping coffees made by our robot barista. If a robot arm could look expectant, this one does. Like, it's waiting for the next order. Well, I, I, that's true, but it's totally immobile. You notice that? It doesn't, it doesn't even twitch. I guess it's not excited by the scene here. I'll say one thing. Crowds of people are walking by and admiring the robot. It is, if all it is is a novelty, it is drawing attention. You know, the coffee's, the coffee's pretty good. I have to say the coffee is good, and I'm a little surprised by that, because this, in a way, is kind of a souped-up vending machine, right? Don't let the robot hear you say that. No, no, he doesn't care. But, it's, <laughs> but unlike a vending machine, it isn't powdered coffee or powdered milk or powdered something. So it's fresher ingredients. We can't credit the, the robot barista with any of that. I mean, that was the supplier put the good coffee in there and put it in the milk. I mean, really, what did the robot do? Yeah, well, all it did was serve it, but he also attracted you to this place to get the coffee. Maybe that's, you know, maybe you should view this robotic arm as being in marketing as opposed to serving. Well, one of the benefits to the company, Cafe X, is that you could be serving coffee 24 hours a day if you wanted to, and you would never have to employ a human. Right, exactly. If you wanted to go on a coffee break, of course, that would be an internal affair. Moving from robots to artificial intelligence, we are just north of the Silicon Valley, the Center for Artificial Intelligence Research, and where Google Director of Research Peter Norvig works. Yes, indeed. I mean, these robotic arms, that's for repetitive biz, but what about artificial intelligence? Is it going to take all our jobs? Well, Peter Norvig gives us his perspective on the future of AI in the workplace, and he doesn't seem to fear that humans will be left with nothing to do as the machines take over. We spoke to him at the annual meeting of the AAAS, that is the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Austin, Texas. Dr. Norvig was there along with the heads of research from Facebook and Microsoft to make the case that artificial intelligence will augment, not replace human capabilities. Well, Peter, some are making the case that there will be a major workplace turnover in that AI and robots will take over everything except for manual labor tasks that require some dexterity. And you have a different take. It's more nuanced. What is that? I, I like to think about tasks rather than jobs to say, uh, wh what is it that you do? Break it down into components and then say, what are the right tools to help you do that? Right? So if I want to uh, dig something up, if it's a small thing, I'll go and get a shovel. If it's a big thing, I'll go and get a bulldozer. And I'll use the right tool for the job. I'm still involved, the tool's involved, uh, and we get the job done together. Well, that sounds a lot like the way it proceeds now. There are things that humans do and things that the machines do and then uh, problems that AI solves. But I think the humans and AI will be working more closely together, in your view. Yeah, I think that's right. I think uh, it, it's a, a different kind of partnership, and AI plays a part of it. I think communication technology plays a part of it, so that you'll see teams working from around the world together that previously had to be in one place to do that. So we'll change the way that uh, work is done. AI and automation will be one of the important tools to do that. People are very flexible. If it's worth doing, then it's worth having a human in there to do it better. Can you give an example of the sort of collaboration you envision between AI and, and humans that maybe we're not imagining or experiencing right now? Oh, I guess the best kinds of collaborations are things where uh, the m machine can go over the kind of routine things and the human can use their intuition for uh, something that machines can't. And so one thing is trying to analyze crime or terrorism where for some things you have a lot of data, but for a lot of things you don't, right? Where there's only been a few instances of this kind. And there, a human analyst who's lived this for a long time is gonna be more flexible, but they're gonna wanna ask questions. Uh, what's going on in this area over here? Put up a map and plot these things versus those things. And so the computer will be doing that. Maybe the computer will even be making suggestions for 
here's some hypotheses I have. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. But the human will be in the loop uh, using their judgment as well. So people who put forth the idea that, that the robots are going to take over, you would not agree with that? No, I, I think the robots will be helpful to us, but I think the, the people are still going to be in charge. And, you know, it's always hard to automate everything to the last degree. And so having a human there is going to be what we need. And then I think another aspect is, you know, we have great technologies to say, if you tell me what to optimize, I can do that, right? So essentially that's what, what AI says. And if I know what it is I want to optimize, uh, I, ha I have great algorithms to do that. But oftentimes the trickiest part is figuring out what is it that I want, right? What is it that we should be striving for? And that's uh, ultimately a human question. And so humans are going to have to be involved in figuring out what is it that you want as an individual, and then collectively, what do, you want, what do we want as a society? To use a specific example, coming from your own company, Google, our show is produced in Mountain View, and if you are on the streets at all, you will see a self-driving car. They are being tested in the area. Mm -hmm. Will these cars always have potential for human to override the system? In other words, will a human always be in the loop? Or do you imagine, in this case, with cars, that the human will just go along for the ride? So there's a lot of different use cases. So uh, we, there's this uh, kind of automated taxi idea of the, the car takes you where you need to go. There's a kind of valet parking idea of I get my car to the destination and maybe I drive it myself because I like driving, maybe it drives some of the way. But then once I get there, I just hop out and it goes and parks somewhere. And that way we don't need parking lots that are right near the destination. They can be farther away and things are easier. Uh, there's also like delivery of objects to neighborhoods. And these applications are nice because it's okay if the car is going slower when, when nobody's in it and you don't have to worry about pleasing the passengers. That sounds pretty harmonious, but what if the automatically driving car develops a mind of its own, maybe we won't use the word mind, but decides to just drive you across country and you can't stop it. So the idea is, will there always be a way for the human to stop the machine? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 w I wouldn't want to use a device that I didn't have control over. And so I, so I think that'll always be the case. You know, and, the, and there's got to be uh, limits to that. Uh, and we've seen that already. You know, you look at like uh, self-driving uh, airplanes, and there's actually been difference of opinions between uh, Airbus and Boeing in terms of uh, how much can the pilot override what the plane is doing and how much is the plane doing unautomated and how much is the pilot doing. People take different approaches to that, and I think part of the, uh, the science, you know, there's a science of AI of, of how can we do things right, but then there's another science of human computer factors of how do we interoperate and how do we build a team between the automated system and the human. And I think that science will have to advance so we figure out exactly what controls do you want to have, what do you want to be able to say, how is the system going to feed back to say, well, you told me to do this, but that's a bad idea for the following reasons. You could have AI doing the job so efficiently that you put the humans out of business or you make them redundant. What will we do with our time if the machines are doing most of the work for us? I think there's always lots of things to do. I think the AI will tend to do the things that are uh, more routine, and so hopefully it'll be uh, more interesting jobs that are left over. And if you have uh, robots working for you, then it just frees up more of your time to do the things that you want to do. Well, finally, Peter, it sounds like you're not worried that a um, artificially intelligent Peter Norvig is going to take over your job. <laughs> well, I can still use lots of help, so uh, I hope we can build some tools to help me do it, uh, my job easier. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Peter Norvig is the Director of Research at Google. Well, the Silicon Valley is one of the centers for AI research. Companies here are working on everything from facial recognition to machine learning to, as we heard from Dr. Norvig, autonomous vehicles. These AI technologies may change how we work and America is leading the way in building them. But for how long? Because there is actually another disruptive aspect to the growth of AI. The development of the transformative technology may be moving across the Pacific. China is looking to overtake the U.S. lead in artificial intelligence. 
The Chinese government has pledged more than $1 billion to build an AI industrial park outside of Beijing. It is said that it wants China to be the global leader in AI research by 2030, so journalist Owen Churchill recently reported in the journal Nature. It's part of a wider picture, if you like, of China trying to reposition itself from a, a manufacturing powerhouse, a center of production, to a center of design and, and innovation and creativity. I mean, this is not a minor industrial sector. This promises to be extremely important, right, artificial intelligence? Absolutely. It's, I mean, it's an area that has wide-reaching ramifications across the whole sector of society. China is pushing for AI developments within medicine, within the military, um, public security, and you're already seeing many ways in which the technology is being used to varying degrees. If anyone's been following China recently, they will have probably seen reports of facial recognition software being utilized by public security bodies, quite divisively actually, being used to monitor, to track and pursue people of interest, for example, in, in Xinjiang province out in the west of the country. So that's an example of it being used for public security, but there's also other applications um, in China, which of course faces huge problems of gridlock traffic and overpopulated cities. So AI has uses in those situations as well, where the computer might have a slight edge over the human mind. Well, well, Owen, what does it mean for China to be a leader in artificial intelligence? I mean, what's the metric here? Is it number of papers published, the number of products in the market, or are they selling these devices around the world? I mean, what would they consider being a leader? Well, it's, it's a great question. In this multi-page report that was issued last year, they had some numbers in there. They want to create an AI industry by 2020 of 150 billion yuan. I suspect that's, that's close to $22 billion. And then by 2030, they want that to have grown to 1 trillion yuan. So there are some measurable targets that the government has set itself. Other than that, it's harder to say and it's quite subjective in that they want to be a centre of innovation and certainly there are signs that they're on the right track. Um, I think in 2014, the country China overtook for the first time, overtook the states in the number of publications on deep learning that were published and also importantly cited um, in the academic world and, and I think the number of patents is also on the rise. But it's really quite difficult to say. We'll have to check in in 10 years' time and see whether the international community um, shares the Chinese government's confidence that it can achieve these goals. The, the government announced it will spend the equivalent of something like $2 billion on an AI industrial park in, a, in the mountainous countryside about 20 miles west of Beijing. Is this, is this going to be like a campus or a startup incubator neighborhood with a bunch of you know, small companies? I mean, what, what do they envision? It's likely to be a startup incubator, but on steroids. It's just going to be absolutely huge. As you said, it's a multi-billion dollar venture the developer of that project has been fairly opaque thus far about what exactly it will resemble when it's finished. But it's looking to be completed within five years and you're going to have hundreds of private enterprises stationed there. It's quite far out of the city of Beijing, out to the west, so quite insular and, and self-contained. I think they're talking about having a supercomputer housed there as well. Your article in Nature reported that while the country has an ambitious plan to be a global leader in artificial intelligence, you talked to an analyst who says that talent remains a major bottleneck. Now, how can China be a world leader in AI if it doesn't have the engineers? Is it recruiting everywhere? I mean, is it doing what, I guess, the University of Texas years ago just bought their way into physics by buying the best physicists? That's exactly what they're trying to do. And by looking at the situation today, it seems to be working to an extent. They have programs um, such as the Thousand Talents Plan, which is basically an aggressive recruitment drive to pull in talent from around the world. As of last year, there were only about 50,000 AI engineers working within that sector compared to upwards of 800,000 in the States. So for a country of China's size to have so few people working on artificial intelligence goes to show just how far they have to go. So China's really... To use a crude analogy, China's, yes, very late to the party, but it's turned up to the party with, with a huge bag of gift vouchers and goodies, and it's saying to people, well, come over to our house for a bigger party, something you've never seen before. So if China does succeed at this, if they do become a world leader in AI, not, not necessarily the world leader, it seems to be a world leader within a dozen years, I mean, does, I mean you've mentioned that sounds like it overtakes the U.S., could even Google become an also ran compared to some Chinese company? I mean, is this a real threat to, to leadership in the West? Personally, I, I wouldn't call it a threat. I think that the 
competition is healthy. And I think that firms around the world recognize that. In terms of AI, China is not taking an insular approach to this. They're saying, okay, we, we recognize that the beating heart of international artificial intelligence remains to be Silicon Valley. And that's why they're putting so many resources into setting up research centers just down the road from where you are in Sunnyvale. So I think that goes to show that China's not out necessarily to get the world. It's out to work with what talent there is out there, admittedly, to better its own AI capabilities. And I have to say that the reverse apparently is also happening, that uh, Google has its own AI research center in Beijing, does it not? Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, it goes to show that they're taking this seriously. The fact that Google isn't accessible in China, nor are its related services. And the fact that they're, you know, investing physically and financially in having a presence there goes to show how seriously they take it. So, oh, and do you think there are possible hurdles to China's ambitious AI dream coming from, you know, the structure of the government itself? I mean, maybe it will be hard to attract researchers to become leaders in innovation if your society restricts internet access or controls information being exchanged within the research community. In other words, could the rather closed society you have in China hinder its ambitions? I think that's a really important question and one that people are asking themselves a lot in today's age when you have a society like China that restricts access to the internet, restricts content on the internet to quite a significant degree. We've seen recently, only a few months ago, that a microscopic example of that was two AI bots that were developed and put online by Tencent. You know, you could have conversations with these bots and they're asked questions about their views on the governing party, the, the Communist Party, and they gave kind of unorthodox and slightly critical responses. And they were promptly taken offline and rejigged and had their wires double-checked and everything and then put back online in rather more benign forms. That goes to show that, yes, there is going to be tension between the ruling governing authority and the push for innovation, pure innovation within research. But I don't think that it's a clear-cut dichotomy. I think that there is scope for very good research within AI that doesn't necessarily have a political element or doesn't necessarily cross cross boundaries that have been put in place by the Chinese government. Owen Churchill, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thanks a lot for having me. Owen Churchill is a London-based journalist who covers China, and he wrote about the coming AI revolution in China in the journal Nature. Well, here's a reason why it may take a while before a robot remodels your kitchen or puts on a hard hat and climbs some scaffolding. Robotics is not easy. Although our robotic barista makes it look easy. Yeah, but he hasn't climbed any scaffolds, right? I mean, (laughs) he doesn't even have legs. In fact, he only has one arm. I, I think that, you know, you shouldn't judge by this guy. He's not going anywhere. He does only one thing, coffee. So really, flexible robots, maybe not so trivial. Coming up, lessons we're learning about getting robots to do what humans do. From NASA's first humanoid robot designed for construction work on Mars. All right, if we get another cup of coffee, I have to switch to decaf. (laughs) You don't want to stay awake for this? What's the deal? (laughs) It is Meet Your Robot Barista on Big Picture Science. Well, while this disembodied robotic arm at Cafe X is mightily impressive, joining four limbs to assemble a complete humanoid robot that does more than froth milk is definitely challenging, especially if you're gonna pack it up and send it to Mars. Valkyrie is NASA's first bipedal humanoid robot. An impressive six feet of metal, servos and digital electronics, it is a prototype for what ultimately will be a construction worker on Mars. Now, as we heard earlier in the show, Martin Ford predicts that humans will keep the jobs that require physical dexterity, and the lessons from Valkyrie suggest that indeed that is the case for now. How much physical dexterity does our robotic barista need? Not terribly much. I mean, he's, you know, you could call him Tom Servo. He just needs some relatively low wattage servo motors, and he can lift up a cup of coffee. Kimberly Hambuchen is an aeronautics engineer and the principal technologist of robotics at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and she's part of the team working on Valkyrie. We spoke to her at the AAAS conference in Austin, where she explained what it takes to get a bipedal robot to climb the stairs. It's really a two-part problem. There's the hardware, and so you have to develop the hardware that can actually create 
the torque to make the legs walk upstairs. And then there's the software that allows the robot to actually keep itself balanced while it's on one leg, moving its next leg up the next step. What I'm taking away from this is that it's really complicated. So we take our knees for granted. I can move my knees like this. I run upstairs. You take everything in your body for granted and the fact that you don't have to actually think about walking upstairs. You don't have to think about just walking down the road and keeping yourself balanced. So we, we liken our robots to babies, possibly very, very, very young toddlers. Um, if you watch babies start to learn how to walk, that's pretty much what our robots look like right now in walking. They fall down a lot. That's why they're always tethered. They can't always make it up a step. They can't always turn around. So, yes, our brains are fantastic computers, and we are not even close to being able to have the computation necessary yet to go as fast in our processors to do the sorts of things that humans do. Let's talk about Valkyrie, and if you could give an overview of this robot, which I understand is NASA's first bipedal robot, and exactly um, in what ways can it move like a human? It can walk, can it squat, or physically, yes. how does it move around? So it can walk. The robot was obviously designed to walk, and it can climb up stairs, climb up a step at a time, I'll say, we really have focused on what we call whole body motion with this robot. And whole body motion is just what you and I do every day, you know, move around and balance and do things. But in robotics, it is a very complicated field of control. But it doesn't have the whole suite of, of movement that a human has. So could you hand, for example, Valkyrie a broom and would the robot know what to do with the broom? Oh, no, the robot doesn't really know what to do with much of anything, but it knows how to keep itself upright based on the constraints that you're putting on it. If you say you need to put both of your hands on this object and move it in this motion, which is how we would tell it to sweep with a broom, it would know what to put into its algorithm that says, here are all the things you have to keep in mind. Now tell me where to put the center of mass of each foot. Okay, so this is an autonomous robot. That's what you're working towards. It's not a fully autonomous. Autonomy means different things to different people. For me, autonomy means the robot knows exactly what to do and can go do it without human intervention or a human in the loop. Very, very few robots in the world can do things without the human in the loop. And so Valkyrie needs a human operator to tell it what to do. The robot can actually figure out how to place its feet to walk, to balance, to you know, climb upstairs or something. But we haven't focused on making the robot completely autonomous where we say, hey, Valkyrie, go put a scaffold together and the robot knows what to do. But it's also not haptic. So you don't have someone in a sensor suit moving and then the robot is mimicking those movements. So someone in one room would be moving and the robot would be mimicking. No, because we have a unique situation in space at NASA that we will most likely have time delays between the communication from the robot operator to a robot. So we have found that you cannot do what we call direct teleoperation where the robot is taking every single joint angle command from a person. You can't do that reliably really with more than a few hundred milliseconds. So we're focused on uh, actually saying, okay, here's an object that you're gonna go interact with. Here's where you put your hands to get to the object, for example, if it was a drill, we would tell the robot how to approach grabbing that drill so that it could put its finger on the trigger mm -hmm. and then tell it how to actually pull the trigger and where it needs to put the drill to actually do the drilling. So could you give us an overview of the kind of tasks that you want Valkyrie or the next generation bipedal robot to do? What sort of tasks are required of it in space? So it, we really are focused on surface activities with this robot and really Mars because it turns out that walking isn't very useful on the moon, but Mars, the Mars gravity is much more amenable to a walking body type. We have a concept of sending a lot of equipment to Mars before a crew gets there for a mission. And we don't expect that it's all going to land and then, bam, just be there perfectly waiting for the crew. And we also don't want a crew that spent maybe nine months in microgravity or 
zero gravity actually, going to Mars, they're going to need some recovery time. So we can't expect them to just hop out of their spacecraft and say, oh, let's put our habitat together. So, <laughs> Like you do when you're camping. Yeah, exactly. I mean, imagine taking a 24-hour plane ride and then having to get off that and then go set up your campsite. That would not be fun. So you send the robots up first? Yes. Robots, habitats, rovers, things like that. And this particular type of robot would be able to manage setting up things for the habitat, uh, setting up the water system, life support systems, things like that, because the systems will be built for the humans to also maintain and fix in an emergency. So anything you can think of, uh, there will probably be multiple valves that need to be turned. There will be things that need to be plugged in. There will be a lot of connectors that need to be connected. So those sorts of things. And, you know, really the human form is the most generic robot form you could have. Well, that was going to be my next question, is why you model these robots on the human form. Now, if you're taking a piece of hardware and putting it on another planet, isn't there advantage to having wheels, for example, or having your center of gravity much lower than you would with what looks like at least a six foot tall robot? Yes, she's six feet tall. Oh, so she is a she. I wondered about that. I call her a she. NASA's official stance is that robots don't have gender, but everyone ends up calling robots he's or she's, and she looks more she. I believe Valkyrie is the name of females in Norse mythology. Norse goddesses who collected the righteous who were wounded or dying on the battlefield and took them to Valhalla. You really nodded when I said you want your center of gravity lower. It's tricky. Well, so if we were not doing manned missions to Mars, I would not be advocating for this format of robot at all because you would design the entire environment that you're putting up there around whatever robot you've decided to put up there. And most likely you're going to have a wheeled robot because of the terrain. But if you're going to have a human environment and everything will be designed for people between 5'4 and 6'4 to walk through, to climb up, then having another a robot assistant that is actually shaped like the people means that there's a lot of things you don't have to add so that the robot that maintains things can get through. As impressive as Valkyrie is, and and the videos are impressive of this robot, I believe there are four of them right now in the world, this is not the robot that is going to go up onto Mars, and there's many things that you need to do. So can you just briefly, what are a couple things that need to be accomplished before we send a robot into space? So I've been thinking a lot about this in the past few weeks. One of the biggest things is we need these robots to understand where they are on a surface and how to get to where they need to go. We right now don't really know how to do that very well for robots that are moving very fast. Like the Mars rovers have a team of people to figure out where it is. They can do some what we call localization where the robot can kind of figure out where it is, but they aren't moving very quickly. So there's not a need to update their position all the time. The other issue is specifically on the surface of the moon, How do you make a robot that can actually last through what we call a lunar night, which is essentially two weeks of darkness, where it is very cold? So it has to do with temperature, not that the robot might be lonely. No, not that the robot might be lonely. No, we we at NASA are not focusing on giving our robots personalities, (laughs) I can tell you that. But not just the temperature, also the radiation. Okay. Well, finally then, Kimberly, it sounds like you have your work cut out for you there at NASA. Uh, The results are impressive so far. But what would you say to someone who makes the case that, you know what, pretty soon robots are going to take over, they're going to take all human jobs. You watch out, you humans. So I have a two-part answer to that. First off, when you've been in robotics for as long as I have, you know that that day is not coming. I won't see that day in my lifetime, and I'm 43. Um... You, that day is not even close to coming. Secondly, I think there will be jobs that robotic automation is going to be better than humans at and will take over that field. But there will always be a new field that comes up because of that activity that then creates more jobs for the humans. We'll need people to fix those robots when they break. We'll need people to maintain those robots. That's just one. So I I think there are multiple reasons why robots aren't going to take over the world or take over all of our jobs. But the biggest reason is 
it's they're just too dumb and too stupid and too fragile right now to take over much of anything. Kimberly Hambuchen, thank you so much for speaking with us. You're welcome. Kimberly Hambuchen is an aeronautics engineer and the principal technologist of robotics at NASA's Johnson Space Center. So Seth, are you worried that the robots or AI are coming for your job? Not terribly worried because my behavior is so unpredictable (laughs) and often illogical. I'm not actually worried. Any robot that could take over my job would get fired right away. It's funny you say that because that's something we may miss when the machines take over is just human fallibility, human illogic. Well, that could be. Maybe they could program illogic logic into these things. Well, thanks to the team that is irreplaceable, senior producer Gary Niederhoff, operations manager Barbara Vance, and intern Anna Katrina Hunter. And thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the behavior of rings around planets. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called Meet Your Robot Barista. If you want to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find past episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because robots don't listen to the radio, if that makes any sense, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. Let's see if you can take your coffee back and get the robot to add a little bit more milk to it. Okay. Uh, Hello, robotic arm. Hello. Okay, so you're tapping on the glass. You're not getting its attention. Not not responding. (laughs)